Now, uh, I want to briefly introduce our guest and then uh, to let him have the, have the floor. So let's introduce him. Para fomentar el liderazgo en educación, políticas y estándares relacionados con la leadership in standards related to the internet. Vincent Cerf was the first president of ISOC and he was the lead engineer of NCCI Mail, the first commercial email service to be connected to the internet. He has received honorary degrees and awards that include the National Medal of Technology, the Turing Award, the Presidential Medal of Freedom awarded by the President of the United States, the Marconi Prize, and a membership in the National Academy of Engineering. In 2002, he received the Prince of Asturias Award for Science and Technology. Surf received a Bachelor of Science degree in Mathematics for Stanford University and received an MS degree and a PhD degree in Engineering from UCLA and has been awarded 29 honorary degrees from universities across the world. Well, well I am now in the English Channel. And um, good morning, Bean. Well, good afternoon here in the Canary Island, you know. So, I should say buenos dias, uh, buenos tardes, uh, buenos noches, uh, depending on where you are. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to join you today. This is a special treat for me. I've never been in the Canary Islands, but I want very much to visit, particularly because of the astronomy that goes on. Uh, on the islands. It's a huge contribution to science uh, in addition to all the other things that, uh, that you do. So um, I'm very excited about uh, the new developments that are underway uh, to uh, build new telescopes and to uh, reveal new knowledge. But today's discussion is about the internet and the role that it plays and it could play uh, in our uh, society. And I want to reinforce the message that you already um, implied, uh, which is that internet does best when it is safe and secure, it protects privacy, it's open and fully accessible to everyone, it's interoperable, it's reliable, and it's affordable. We need to satisfy all of those objectives if the internet is going to be the beneficial uh, system, which we know it can be and has been. Uh, when I, I'm going to show you a, a presentation that kind of runs through the history of the internet and then tries to reveal uh, what are the challenges are that we see today and in the future. Uh, and then we, I think, should have a discussion about what actions uh, the Internet Society uh, can undertake in order to uh, overcome some of the challenges that we now see uh, with the way in which the Internet is being used. So I'm going to share my screen with you, assuming I uh, can do this uh, correctly. Let's see, I have to go find it. Um, this is always the challenge is find, oh, there it is. Okay, I'm on the, well, well, I, I found it. Well, got, I should go back right. over to the first slide and then I want to go uh, to blow it up. And now I think you can, everybody can see this, uh, this first slide. So um, I'm going to just take you through some history. Uh, some of you will have lived through it and even contributed to it. So, um, and some of you perhaps don't know all of the stories. Uh, there isn't time to go through every single um, story that, uh, uh, that it's associated with the net. But let me take you back to 1969 for a moment. Uh, this is where my first introduction to this system happened. I was a graduate student at UCLA working in Professor Leonard Kleinrock's office. He was running what was called the Network Measurement Center, and I was the principal programmer uh, using the Sigma 7 machine that you see at the bottom to generate artificial traffic in the network and then to measure its performance and compare that performance with uh, queuing theoretic models that Kleinrock and his students developed to predict how this packet switching network would behave under load. And so my job was to try to gather data to support the theoretical um, predictions. 
And what I can tell you is that uh, we were very successful in demonstrating with this network that packet switching uh, was a useful computer communications technology. And there, it was, uh, as you can see, uh, this four node system was in operation in December of 1969. By 1971, uh, one of our number had invented uh, network email and it became among the most popular of the applications on the internet, in addition to remote access to time sharing systems and the transfer of files from one machine to another. So this successful result uh, led the Defense Department, which funded this work, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, to um, choose to go further into the exploration of computer communications in support of what they call command and control. And so, uh, oh, I guess I should tell you that this, this was an, a, a, a celebration of the ARPANET in 1994, 24, uh, 25 years after its uh, uh, activation, it took us, uh, John Postel and Steve Crocker and me, uh, an entire day to uh, set up for this picture for Newsweek magazine. And you can see that we had to find uh, uh, zucchinis and yellow squash and big tins of, uh, of coffee. Uh, to demonstrate to the general public how primitive networking was in 1969. And I hope you'll appreciate the geek joke uh, in this picture. You'll notice that it's ear to ear and mouth to mouth, but no mouth to ear. This network would never work. And that was our little geek joke for the people who understood uh, how, this, uh, how this network was supposed to run. Uh, here is what happens uh, uh, some years later. Uh, after the ARPANET is operating, my colleague Robert Kahn, who was involved in the ARPANET design, came to visit me at Stanford University, where I went after my uh, graduate work at UCLA. And he said to me uh, in 1973 that uh, he had a problem because if we were going to use computers in command and control, they would have to be in mobile vehicles, in ships at sea, and in airplanes. And we couldn't use dedicated telephone circuits to connect all those together as we had done on the ARPANET. So he had already started work in 1973 on a mobile packet radio system and a packet satellite system uh, in order to um, test the idea of computer communications in mobile, ground mobile environments and in uh, shared satellite situations. So uh, by 1976, I had left Stanford to join ARPA to run the internet research program. And in 1977, this was the configuration that we wanted to demonstrate to show that the TCP IP protocols would function in this very diverse networking environment. The, each of the networks, packet radio, packet satellite, and ARPANET had different packet sizes, had different data rates, had different latencies, had different error rates, and yet the entire system had to look uniform to all the computers that were running on it. And of course, that's what the TCP IP protocols were all about. In this particular case, we had a, uh, uh, a mobile radio van, the SRI van, going up and down the San Francisco Bayshore Freeway, radiating packets that went in through a gateway to the ARPANET all the way to London. Then out of London, it went into the packet satellite network and then back to the United States through another gateway into the ARPANET and then down to USC Information Sciences Institute. Uh, the SRI uh, international system and the um, ISI systems were only 400 miles apart in Los Angeles and San Francisco. But the packets in order to get there uh, had gone through two uh, synchronous satellite hops back and forth across the Atlantic uh, and the US. So the packets went 100,000 miles to be delivered 400 miles away. And it actually worked. And for me uh, in the Defense Department at the time, it was a critical demonstration of the TCP IP protocols. So if we um, fast forward now into the 1980s, the National Science Foundation decided to adopt the TCP IP protocols 
and to build something called the National Science Foundation Network, and also a half a, a dozen intermediate level networks to take advantage of the fact that the internet was designed to connect multiple networks to each other. In this same time frame, the Department of Energy built its Energy Sciences Network, again, based on TCPIP, and uh, NASA built the NASA Science Internet, which is another backbone. So we had four backbones operating um, along with the intermediate level networks. So a couple dozen networks were running in the uh, late 1980s. And about that same period, late 1980s or so, uh, I began to think that, uh, that the general public might benefit from having access to the internet. But up until that time, it was only available to people who were uh, getting uh, research funding from the Department of Energy or NASA or DARPA uh, or NSF. Uh, and so the question was, how could we open this up to the general public? And I concluded that the government wasn't going to pay for everybody's use of the network. And so we had to build an economic engine, uh, a commercial engine that would support the further spread of the internet. And so I got permission in 1988 to interconnect the MCI mail commercial email system to the internet as a test. And of course it, it broke what was called the appropriate use policy because NSF said no commercial traffic could go on the government sponsored backbone. Uh, and as a consequence of having broken that particular restriction, later in 1989, three commercial internet services were started in the United States. One was called UUNet, one was called PSINet, and one was called SurfNet in the Southern California area. So we saw the beginnings of commercial internet services in the late 1980s. In the late 1991 period, Tim Berners-Lee uh, introduced uh, the World Wide Web uh, and it was uh, a text-based system at the time. And not too many people noticed that he had done this from CERN in Switzerland except two people at the National Center for Supercomputer Applications in Illinois, uh, Mark Andreessen and Eric Bina, saw the text-based World Wide Web and said, what would happen if we created a graphical user interface? And so they invented a browser called Mosaic, which allowed the, uh, both text and imagery to be shared and distributed throughout the World Wide Web. Uh, and eventually, of course, streaming audio and video. Jim Clark, who was the founder of Silicon Graphics, saw the Mosaic browser and realized this was a big deal. And he brought Mark Andreessen and Eric Bina to the West Coast, US West Coast, to start something called Netscape Communications in 1994. In 1995, the company went public and its stock went through the roof it started what we called in the US the dot boom, where the venture capital companies were throwing money at anything that looked like it had something to do with the internet. And of course that dot boom sort of collapsed in April of 2000 when a lot of the companies that got started ran out of capital because they hadn't started generating any revenue. So we call that the dot bust. But internet continued to grow in many cases exponentially uh, even after that period. So uh, that's sort of the, a, a capsule summary from about 1969 to 2000 of the uh, internet's evolution. Of course, since that time in the 20 years since 2000, a great deal has happened and many of you have been responsible for that. This is what the internet looks like now. Uh, it is simply a gigantic network of hundreds of thousands of nets. This is intended to demonstrate the different colors represent different networks. This is totally distributed. There is no central authority with one exception. Uh, the networks build uh, their own facilities. They choose what software to run. They choose what hardware to run. They choose who to interconnect with on their own terms and conditions. It's all fully distributed. The only thing which is centralized, as you all know, is that the allocation of internet addresses and the assignment of domain names is done in a centralized fashion so that uh, these assignments are unique. And the uniqueness is very important for internet to operate. 
Uh, I don't, won't bother with this slide because everyone on this call knows exactly how the internet works. I use this to tell people who don't know uh, a simple model of thinking about the net by associating internet packets with uh, postcards because they both behave very much in the same way, but we'll pass through that one. Uh, now, this is where I really want to get into uh, the challenges that you and I, as members of the Internet Society, uh, face. And it is a collection of issues that are increasingly important for us to tackle and solve, even though uh, the solutions are not obvious. And they are, in fact, going to require a great deal of creativity and collaboration on an international basis. So uh, one, I've already mentioned how important reliability, safety, privacy, security, interoperability, and autonomy are. The autonomy part uh, simply has to do with the fact that uh, if you think about the internet of things and the billions of devices that are running internet software now, and the billions more that will come, imagine that your house is full of these things. And for some of you, that's already true. You certainly don't want your house to stop functioning if the internet connection breaks. So it's very important that the IoT devices, the Internet of Things devices, still work even if the internet connection goes away. Uh, and then, of course, when it comes back, uh, all full functionality could be restored. Uh, the second thing, which is uh, very important, has to do with the uh, recent decade or so of investment in artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, we've seen spectacular things made possible by advances in machine learning, but we've also learned that these algorithms are not necessarily 100% reliable. They will sometimes make mistakes. They will sometimes break in unexpected ways. And those, break, those failures uh, can have serious consequences, especially when you imagine a self-driving car uh, is using heavily, uh, dependent on machine learning and making a mistake and running into something uh, causing damage or worse. So we have work to do to make sure that we can speak of these technologies in a way that, a credible way that says that we achieve all those desirable properties that you see on this chart. The second bullet has to do with the um, emergence of a serious problem of the rapid spread of misinformation and disinformation in the online environment. We see it most visibly in uh, the social networking media like YouTube or Twitter or Facebook. Uh, and the, we're still trying to understand the reasons why misinformation and disinformation propagate so rapidly in the system. Some of it has much to do with psychology. It has to do with anthropology and sociology. It has to do with the fact that some people are willing to accept information without critically asking where it came from and whether it's credible. And so critical thinking turns out to be an incredibly important defense against misinformation and disinformation, but it takes work it's a lot like the scientific method where you have a theory which you're holding you know, close uh, to your chest and you really uh, believe in. And then you, as a good scientist, will say, well, I better test my theory to make sure that it's real. And so you run experiments to see whether your theory will predict the experimental results. And if the results don't match the predictions, if you're a good scientist, you will give up that theory and adopt a new one that explains the results. But not everyone is comfortable with that. Some people, uh, all of us, I'm sure, have beliefs that we sort of want to hang on to because they're uh, beliefs that our community and our, our friends uh, have adopted. And we are comfortable in these, even if they're wrong. We have real work to do to undo the damage that's potentially uh, possible by the reinforcement of misinformation and disinformation. And of course, one of the ways in which we can achieve that objective is to increase the level of digital literacy in our communities so that people understand these phenomena. They recognize that when they are online, they are at risk, that there are people who may try to fool them by sending phishing emails or by attacking their systems with malware or 
uh, or doing other kinds of harmful uh, things, we need for people to be aware of those uh, potential hazards and to be thoughtful about protecting themselves. For example, using two-factor authentication instead of just using passwords is an example of a tool that we can offer people to protect themselves. Now, there's uh, because I want to make sure that, uh, that there's time for some discussion, I'm, I'm not going to try to go through every single bullet uh, on these charts. But I do want to emphasize uh, two things to you uh, on these charts. The first one is that because we're part of this global internet society, we have a perspective that talks about um, the the global nature of challenges and responses that we will need to uh, adopt in order to cope with some of these hazards. So law enforcement is a good example. People can be harmed in one country by another person in a different country. And so there are two different jurisdictions. And when even when we recognize the harm and the damage, it's not always easy to track down the party who caused the problem, especially if the victim is in one jurisdiction and the perpetrator is in another. So we are going to have to work together on an international basis to create uh, law enforcement regimes that allow us to cooperate to track down people who are harming others. And we are far from having uh, a set of uh, norms and agreements that will allow us to achieve that objective at the speed at which is needed, given how quickly the internet functions. Uh, this is also um, a, a big issue when it comes to attacks against the internet that are uh, attacking weaknesses in the implementations of applications and the underlying network. Malware and buggy software are the reason we have a lot of trouble and uh, I think our, our essential difficulty is that we've been programming computers for now 80 years or so, but we've never figured out how to write software that doesn't have any bugs. So uh, here I appeal to those of you who are responsible for designing and building programming environments to think very hard about how to expose stupid mistakes before the software actually gets out into use. And knowing that we won't be perfect at that to make sure that when we do distribute software, that there is a way to update it safely and securely, especially as you think about the billions of Internet of Things devices that are going to need upgrading over time. We want to make sure that those devices don't accidentally ingest malware instead of proper and secure updated software. The last point on this slide is that that this imposes an ethical uh, responsibility on all of us who are either producers of or distributors of software to make sure that, uh, that we recognize the potential hazards and we do everything we can to protect against them. Uh, I don't have to tell you that the experience of the pandemic for the past year has highlighted the digital divide in ways that uh, were not necessarily entirely visible. For example, uh, even if you are in a place where the internet is available, if you had to work from home and pretending you even could work from home, that you had work that could be done that way, you might still not have adequate computing and communications capacity so that the kids can go to school remotely while you're working from home. And so you might end up fighting over bandwidth or fighting over devices or not even having a room where you could work in, uh, in peace and quiet. So we've even for those people whose work could be done from home, it still has not been adequate for everyone. And for many people, their work doesn't permit this remote interaction. If you're doing something like cutting someone's hair, you have to be right there. And so proximity has turned out to be a very important part of our uh, ecosystem, our, our economic ecosystem. Uh, and the internet does not solve all of those problems, but even where it can be used, it's not adequately distributed. Not everyone has access to internet. Not everyone can afford it, even if it is available. So there's lots of infrastructure that needs to be um, built and made accessible and affordable 
in order to overcome some of the evident digital divide that we see. Uh, we also uh, can see situations where uh, government policy might inhibit investment in infrastructure, or it might not uh, invite as much competition as we would like in order to drive costs down and to increase quality of service. And finally, um, as we think about the internet, it's not enough to simply have it be there. We have to be able to use it effectively and that requires that we know how to use it. And that means uh, acquiring skills to either create and distribute or use software and the internet in order to do work. And so all of these things are challenges to the uniform utility of the internet. And all of us in the internet society would like everyone to have access to it if it, it will serve their uh, purposes. I, I just thought I would share a couple of surprises um, about internet connectivity. This is a fairly recent picture of the uh, undersea cables that are linking various parts of of the world together. I was astonished at how much investment there has been over the past two decades in undersea cable. It's an enormous amount of capacity. And of course, the next thing which is happening literally as we speak is this uh, very big effort uh, by Elon Musk and uh, Jeff Bezos and others to build low earth orbiting satellites. Um, the the uh, Starlink system is currently planning to put 42,000 satellites up in orbit. And of course the others have similarly very large numbers. Uh, my conclusion, assuming that these are successful, by which I mean the satellites are up there, they actually function as planned and it's an affordable service, it will be impossible to escape access to the internet uh, because some of these will even be in polar orbit. You could go to the North Pole or the South Pole and you still would find yourself able to access the net. And of course, those of us in the internet society would love to see that happen because we want everyone to have access. Uh, this is just a picture of some of the devices that I've encountered in the internet of things space. Uh, but the one I like the most is the internet enabled surfboard. Uh, the, this guy apparently was bored sitting on the water waiting for the next wave. So he put a laptop in the surfboard so he could surf the internet while he was waiting for the next wave on his surfboard. And he put a, a Wi-Fi service at the rescue shack. And so he's selling that as a product. It's amazing. And I remember telling jokes that someday every light bulb would have its own IP address. This is not a joke anymore. There's a product from Philips called Hue, H-U-E, uh, which allows you to remotely control the color of your light bulb and how bright or dim it is. And of course, these other uh, examples uh, you're all familiar with. Uh, in fact, um, I made a, a list of uh, various things that uh, you know we can expect or have already seen. Uh, and since I'm running over time here, let me just mention that that I've been imagining what it's like if your clothes were internet enabled. Imagine that there's an RFID chip in your sock and you're missing you know, the left sock. So you send an SNMTP packet in the house and the sock responds saying, I'm under the sofa in the living room. So we've just solved the problem of the missing sock, which is a huge contribution to society. And I'm very proud of that. Uh, let me go on, though, to just quickly mention uh, another major project which is underway, and that's the interplanetary internet. Uh, it got started in 1998, just after the uh, landing, successful landing of the um, Pathfinder robot on Mars in uh, 1997. Uh, I met with a team at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in 1998. And we asked ourselves, what should we be doing then in 1998 in order to be prepared for what will come 25 years later? And so we began thinking our way through what an interplanetary extension of the internet would look like. Uh, we thought we could use the TCP IP protocols, but we discovered very quickly that the distances between the planets is literally astronomical. And the time delays are significant even between Earth and Mars, which is a fairly near neighbor of ours, it can take as much as 20 minutes for a radio signal 
going at the speed of light to reach the planet. And then of course, another 20 minutes for a response to come back. TCP flow control doesn't do very well with a 40 minute round trip time. Uh, there's another plant, a problem too. The planets are rotating and we don't know how to stop that. And so if you're trying to talk to something on the surface of the planet and it rotates, you have to wait until it comes back around again so you can communicate again. Uh, so we uh, are operating in a highly variable delay and disrupted environment. So we developed a new suite of protocols we call the bundle protocols in order to overcome those limitations. So in 2004, uh, some six years after we began thinking through the interplanetary internet design, two rovers landed on Mars, you'll remember, Spirit and Opportunity in January of 2004. They were supposed to transmit data from the surface of Mars directly to Earth to what's called the Deep Space Network, which is made up of three 70 meter dishes in Madrid, Spain, Canberra, Australia, and Goldstone, California. The radios on board the landers, uh, the rovers, overheated. And so they had to back off on the duty cycle. They were only rated at 28 kilobits a second. And so the scientists were pretty grumpy about this until somebody noticed that there was an X-band radio on the orbiters and an X-band radio on the rovers and that we could relay data up through the orbiters so we uploaded the interplanetary protocol prototypes into the orbiters and the rovers, and we used store and forward communications to transmit all the data back from Mars during the lifetime of uh, Spirit and Opportunity. And when additional landers arrived, Phoenix, uh, the North Pole, the Mars Science Laboratory, and now most recently Perseverance, which landed a couple of weeks ago, all of them are delivering their data through store and forward packet switching using the interplanetary prototype protocols. Uh, so we were pretty excited about that. We've now standardized the interplanetary protocols at the Consultative Committee on Space Data Systems, which is a UN agency, and also in the Internet Engineering Task Force. These are available free of charge on GitHub. You can just download them and make use of them. And so we are uh, well on our way to um, uh, making these available uh, for space exploration. This is what we hope will happen in the long term as we launch new spacecraft to do scientific research. And as those scientific missions have completed their, uh, their uh, missions, we can repurpose those spacecraft as nodes of an interplanetary backbone. So we'll literally grow this network over the decades ahead as these spacecraft become re, uh, available to be repurposed as nodes of the interplanetary network. So that's the last slide. I'll stop there and I'll stop sharing. Uh, and I think we've got uh, some time for uh, Q and A. So I hope that uh, we'll have a chance to do that too. Thank you so much, Ben. Uh, an honor for, for us. Uh, to talk uh, uh, with the, the the man who said, and I quote, uh, I used to, to tell jokes about internet-enabled light bulbs. I can't tell jokes about it anymore. There already is an internet-connected light bulb. <laughs> <laughs> your, 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 your quote about the, the, the internet-connected light bulb. Well, uh, our fellow colleague, um, Ricardo Holski, I hope he has a uh, yeah. question. I, ha I have him um, here. Do you hear me, Bent? Um, yes, I can. Yeah. We have a first question here from Isaac Spain. Which is your opinion about the surveillance capitalism tactics developed by companies like Facebook, Google, Microsoft? Well, um, obviously I have a bias because I work <laughs> with Google. Uh, but let me tell you that this is, this is uh, something of a um, uh, serious concern to a lot of people. Uh, Google has worked very hard and recently has uh, announced a number of changes in the way in which it uh, does its work. 
first of all, we don't sell anyone's information. We don't collect it and sell it. That's not our business model. We do use information like what did you search for in order to figure out what ad we should show you because we think it might be of interest. But we don't sell anything about you. We don't accumulate all of that. Uh, we only, and you can turn this off uh, if you wish. Uh, so instead of getting um, uh, what I will say is tailored advertisements based on what we think you're interested in, you can just get the generic uh, ads that we would put up for anybody. So uh, I think some of the um, uh, concern uh, is, is not uh, merited, uh, at least with regard to Google. And I won't speak to the others because um, I'm not qualified to do that. But I do accept the point here, which is that privacy is important and that we should care greatly about that. In Europe, especially, we've seen an effort to codify that. For example, the general data protection regulations and the right to be forgotten are examples of efforts to uh, allow people to protect their privacy in the online environment. There is, however, a countervailing thing to be concerned about. And that is that if someone has done something that you should know about uh, and they have been able to hide it by applying some of these rules, for example, let us say a politician who's done some bad thing and doesn't want you to know that when the elections come along, then the, the other side of this equation shows up, which is the right to know and the right to not forget. And so here we are as a society uh, making use of these online tools, trying to figure out how do we balance our interest in protecting human rights and privacy and safety, while at the same time using this same tool to make sure that we are not harmed by people who don't have our best interests at heart. And so I think here is where the Internet Society and each of you as members can help and that's think through what's the way that we can um, adopt practices in this online environment to improve the quality of the, uh, the system to support uh, all of its benefits while at the same time diminishing the potential harms. So that's where I come out on that particular question. Uh, if, if you like, I can, I can see the questions here, so I can just quickly go through them. Would, would that be useful? Yeah, yeah of course. Uh, so the next one is from Jordi uh, Pallet, who uh, correctly says that, uh, I, as you, some of you know, I have a, a very uh, nice wine cellar here. It's about 20 feet away from where I'm sitting. And it has uh, a, a collection of um, uh, about 2,000 bottles of wine and I'm concerned about keeping the temperature down. Uh, but we had talked about uh, the idea of instrumenting the corks uh, so that you could interrogate the cork to find out whether the bottle was ready to drink or the wine was ready to drink. And we have yet, not yet gotten the cost down and the physical size down to the point where the sensors will fit inside the cork. So Jordy, if you have some ideas, let me know. We're gonna figure this out. Uh, I see another question, which is in Spanish, and so I'm going to ask for uh, some help from... Well, uh, 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 in, in the meantime, when, uh, when we translate, uh, we have a question for us, uh, for um, our Canary Island chapter. We are uh, working in uh, the possibility to launch the IXP in the Canary Island. How do you... Um, bring us uh, uh, advice uh, about the the uh, the the, uh, is, uh, the convenience of the ISP in, in, in a group of islands. So, uh, first of all, internet exchange points turn out to be incredibly important for linking networks together that are uh, physically nearby. And uh, for a, a while, for example, in the early uh, stages of internet, we had countries in Europe that were uh, connected through the internet by going all the way to the United States and then coming back again across the Atlantic. And of course that added a lot of delay and it reduced bandwidths and everything else. So ISPs are really important for creating coherence among multiple networks uh, in, a, in a specific location. 
I would have thought, however, that uh, the Canary Islands would be another uh, candidate for undersea cable uh, connections. And I can easily see that how valuable that might be for moving uh, the astronomical information <clears throat> collected by the uh, telescopes that are on the island. Uh, in addition to which, of course, some of the connectivity may come from the low Earth orbiting satellites, which, the, uh, which Elon Musk and others are putting up. So uh, I like to see as much interconnection as possible to increase the reliability and the resilience of the internet's infrastructure. Great, thank you. Another question? Uh, the Spanish <laughs> one was a, a great opportunity here in Mr. Cerf, and why, I want to ask if the if he thinks the future of the internet will be more human. It's from Ricardo. From from Casino, sorry, Casino Brera. I'm sorry. Ask the question okay. one more time. Okay. If you think the future of the internet will be more human, ah, is a question from Casino Obrero. It's, it's a very interesting question, and I hope the answer is yes, uh, because after all, the value of the internet is not that the computers are communicating, but that you and I are using that means that means in order to accomplish our objectives, and I think that this attention to the uh, importance of human communication. Uh, is very, uh, very important. Uh, I think you're beginning to see this with voiced interactions, for example, instead of having to type at a keyboard, uh, with online translations, real-time translations taking place. I think more and more uh, we are exploring how to allow humans to choose the way in which they want to communicate with each other or to communicate with the applications on the net. So in Google's case, for example, we have the Google Assistant, uh, which is accepting voiced requests for service or requests for answers or requests for actions. And I think over time, more and more, we will see that kind of um, accommodation uh, happen in the internet environment. So where do we go next? Um, hmm. well, I see uh, a question from uh, Fran Trujillo. Uh, do I believe that the internet for everyone is possible? And the answer is absolutely, I believe that. Uh, and I believe that to get there, however, we have to make it more affordable. And we have to, of course, build out more infrastructure to make it accessible. Uh, the, and this point about accessibility, I want to emphasize, that means making it work for people with disabilities, people who have vision problems or have hearing problems or have uh, you know, mobility problems. We have to overcome those with accommodation. And that's not as easy as, as it sounds. Designing software which accommodates people's disabilities is really quite challenging. And so this is an area of great importance and uh, uh, in need of considerable research in order to make sure that the internet really and truly is for everyone. I see Jesus has asked a question. Young people use a lot of apps and content in the internet, but they are not so well protected against misinformation or other misleading uh, information. How can this be overcome? Uh, I will tell you that uh, my preferred method of dealing with this is what I mentioned uh, briefly in my talk, and that's critical thinking. Uh, we need to teach people, our kids and adults like us, to ask questions. Where did this information come from? Is there corroborating evidence to claims that are being made from credible sources? So that's one thing we can do. The other thing we need to do, I think, is to um, create incentives for the, um, the places that uh, house that information uh, to uh, reduce the level of misinformation that people are allowed to inject into the system. This is easy to say and very hard to do because the, the decision about what is misinformation or disinformation is often opinion. And it's not necessarily a simple equation that you can calculate this is 
this is good information and this is bad information. So we have to help people discover why the sources of information are credible or not, and then let them decide what to do. Let's see, I'm looking for uh, uh, there. Oh, so uh, Siva, uh, Siva Subramanian is asking, why do the core cables stop at the seashore? Why not go inland? Um, you know, I actually don't know the answer to that. Um, and, and to be quite frank, I think I've watched the installation of an undersea cable connection. And I think the, the reason that, uh, that things end uh, at, near the seashore is that the physical connections are actually underwater. And, uh, and so all of that connectivity is done uh, while you're, uh, you know, interconnecting the cables to the uh, cable landing uh, facility. But uh, it's, it's uh, not clear to me uh, why you, you couldn't continue to pull the cable you know, further inland. I don't know the answer to that. Okay, are there other questions? It doesn't look like it, and uh, we have only a couple of minutes left on my clock anyway. Uh, I have a question. Uh, 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 our fellows don't have. Um, internet had a eureka moment yeah, when, when you and your uh, co-founders uh, think about eureka. This is this is the piece we need. The 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 the, the, the piece the the the, the the, uh, and the, the most important piece of the of the net in any moment do you do you have this this moment the moment of oh this is the piece we need I'm not sure that I understood the question uh, Juan uh, maybe you could try one more time well okay uh, uh, do you in, in, in development the internet uh, had a eureka moment? Oh, oh, I, no! Actually, the internet <clears throat> was was not one of those eureka. You know, we can invent something. This was engineering. This is this was serious engineering, and that's true generally for almost everything that happens in the internet. I think that it is. Uh, recognition of a problem or a challenge to be solved. And uh, those of you who are engineers know that engineers love problems. Please give me a problem to solve. That's what engineers like. And so uh, when Bob Kahn and I did this original work, it was to solve a particular problem. How do we achieve command and control support in this online environment with different kinds of networks? And of course, once we solved that problem, we created a new opportunity for solving other problems. And the World Wide Web comes along and it creates a collection of new problems to be solved. And so the engineers in the community should feel very comfortable that they will have work to do forever because there's no end of problems that will need to be solved in this environment. Well, Ben, for all of us, uh, it's an, an honor and a pleasure to share with you uh, this time. And um, of course, you are invited uh, when uh, in the future, when, when we can to uh, make travel, and take some planes again to visit the Canary Islands. Well, I will look forward to a time when we can visit face to face, share a good bottle of wine, and enjoy oh. sharing the Canary Islands together. The Canary Island wine For is, sure. is be very, very best. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. 
and uh, uh, thank you all the all, all the participants, all the attendees, and uh, well, uh, reach us in internetsociety.org. Thank you. So, Thank you, Adiós, adiós. Adiós, hasta luego.